legislation has really failed us thus far in terms of invasive species. The Lacey Act has failed at its purpose. Legislation is more reactive than proactive. So they basically are saying that if you put a ban on it, it's going to increase. But they didn't really find any virtual change in the release of that species to the wild. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's time for part two of this Florida Tegu Iguana ban. And we are going to discuss whether bans even work at all in terms of uh, corralling the invasive species and doing anything to solve that problem. So I did a little bit of digging. I was a, on Google Scholar a lot looking for some publications on the topic. And to be frank, there's not a lot of studies on whether legislation ever works out in terms of bans and stuff like that. There was one pretty solid one that uh, I liked and that actually covered the topic. And then a couple other things I want to reference in terms of the Burmese python in Florida and stuff and how that's kind of worked out. So that's going to be this video, part two. Uh, I think this is going to be a five-part series. i got like three other parts planned. And we're really going to go in depth here, guys. This is an important topic, and I really want to help you guys see the larger picture and make educated opinions. But before we get to the video, make sure you check that lower right-hand corner. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, leave a comment, leave a like. Me and Frapp will both appreciate it. All right, let's get to the video, guys. Okay, so this first publication is really the only publication that speaks directly to the topic at hand. They studied an area in Spain pre- and post-legislative uh, ban, basically. I'll put the formal definition in the publication right up there. Um, this is the only one that really studied some effects pre- and post-ban of a species. Uh, they mainly studied whether there was a change in release of that species to the wild pre and post ban, and whether the sale of that uh, species changed pre and post ban. The findings of the study were actually quite interesting. While they did find that there was a decrease in the amount of sales for an invasive species, um, which would be expected, you know, if it's banned, less people are going to sell it, and it would only be illegal to sell it. But they didn't really find any virtual change in the release of that species to the wild. So it did not stop people whatsoever from releasing that invasive species, which really speaks more to the problem at hand. They go on to say that they believe the primary reason for this being true is that legislation is more reactive than proactive. And I think that's the main argument we are trying to make here, or at least I am trying to make. Uh, this needs to stop at the start, really, and it can't be something that you can do once an invasive species population is already established. Furthermore, and I'm going to read directly from the paper here because I think they say it the best way possible, regulation is better than outright bans because the latter may increase the black market value of the banned species, which is true. There will always be a market. It might be significantly less, but people are still going to try to operate around the law. And our study shows that bans have questionable effectiveness in preventing the release of already widely distributed invasive species, which the iguana and tegu are. They are already established species. No regulation will fully stop animal abandonment, which they show in this, uh, but if the main legal action to curb pet releases is a ban on known invasive species, we envision more pet abandonments and invasions, which they basically are saying that if you put a ban on it, it's going to increase, it's not going to decrease. So this is exactly the opposite of what we want to happen and what this type of a band uh, is supposed to do. In this next publication, they basically talk about how the Lacey Act has failed at its purpose for controlling species coming into the U.S. that are of concern. Basically, it's supposed to stop invasive species. Uh, in this table, you can see a list of all the species on the Lacey Act list. Uh, and whether or not they were established in some sort before they were listed. Uh, based on this table, you can see at least 9 of the 16 tax of 56% currently listed were already in the continental U.S. at the time of listing. At least 7 of 16 tax of 44% had established populations outside of captivity in the continental U.S. when listed. And of 7 tax established by the time of listing, at least 5, 71%, have spread to additional states since listing. So there's not a lot of positives uh, coming out of the Lacey Act. There has been a few successes. I'll put up those successes right here in a paragraph. You can read through them. But basically, it has not done its job at controlling species of concern coming in. And again, it's been very reactive, not proactive. The paper goes on to say that the effectiveness of the Lacey Act at interrupting any of the four steps of the invasion process uh, that being transport, introduction, establishment, and spread, is difficult to quantify, but it's definitely not high. And then it continues on to say sort of where the failures are mainly at. 
Uh, only for the few taxa that were listed before importation is there any evidence of success. Um, and they also attribute that success to possibly being uh, low commercial potential or unsuitable conditions. So it might not even have to do with the Lacey Act itself. Paper continues on to say, with respect to species spread, the injurious wildlife provision prohibits the transport of listed species across state borders. However, five of the seven taxa with established populations have continued to spread since their listing. Basically, that provision has done nothing. The paper goes on to say, pretty much summarizing how much the Lacey Act has failed as a modern invasive species regulatory tool, um, and just shows that we really need to uh, change how we go about preventing invasive species from ever being established, since that's really where it counts. We need to stop it at the start, and there are not enough laws or not enough effective laws doing that. We gotta stop being reactive. Finally, I wanna take a look at these two graphs from two different papers. I really tried to find estimates on populations of the Burmese python, the Nile monitor, any invasive species in Florida to see if pre and post legislation uh, there was a change in population, if it did anything for those invasive species, because Burmese python and uh, Nile monitors are on the conditional species list. list. Um, and I really couldn't find any estimates, nothing that was backed by actual data. Uh, what I did find were two papers based on citizen science, which basically just takes in reports of citizens calling like the sheriff office or something reporting the site of a Burmese python or a Nile monitor or whatever. Uh, so I did find two different papers and they had these graphs. Uh, one talks about removals, but I'm not going to focus on that as much. I want to actually focus on the observations. Uh, we can see, I think around 2010 is when the, this species was added to the conditional list. Um, and we could see while there is a little bit of a dip since 2010 in at least one of these graphs, um, the, the observations, the reports are still plentiful um, and at the minimum are remaining pretty much the same, especially in the later years. One only goes up to 2014 and it does look like it coincides a lot with removals, which obviously if you remove a lot of them, you're going to observe a lot of them. But then the other one is just observations and we can see in 2016, 2017, they were pretty darn high. So from this, I can at least take away that it doesn't look like there's any significant uh, lessening, if you want to say it that way. I don't know what's a better word. Um, any significant, significant dip really in the population of this species since it's, uh, you know, prohibition and stuff like that. So I really wanted to just add that in to give some further context and uh, some amount of really if there's been a dip with other invasive species in Florida since they were banned. Uh, as far as I can tell with what's out there using these graphs and such, there hasn't been a dip. In conclusion, the main ideas I formed off of these papers is that legislation has really failed us thus far in terms of invasive species. They are too reactive and they wait until a species is well established in the wild before reacting and doing something about the problem. Things need to start before they start, if that makes sense. They need to start before species get here. There needs to be more regulations on importation. And regulations are scary. I totally agree. Uh, I know hearing that word is probably scaring a lot of you, but there needs to be more procedure. There needs to be a better way to import things and control things so that they don't become established in the wild. And that doesn't mean banning them. Regulation doesn't mean a straight out ban. It just might mean better education. It just might mean something different that really makes it uh, less probable that someone will release their animal to the wild or that these species will get out in the wild. I think that's the solution. That's what we'll talk about in the next video. We'll talk about solutions to the problem, where things really need to be solved and addressed. Uh, and that will be our part three in this series. Anyway, guys, I hope you appreciated this uh, information here uh, because it took me quite a while and a lot of takes of trying to say this information. I know my girlfriend over there is fed up with me because of all the taping she's been having to help me do. But um, anyway, make sure to subscribe, make sure to like and comment. I really appreciate it. Look, Frap already gave up. He was out halfway through this video. <laughs> all right, guys, I'll see you later.